have this amazing idea. Every time that my family packs to go somewhere, I envision that I will fit everything that I need into a backpack. And I will travel light. I would love for that to happen. In the natural, that does not happen. But this morning, we're going to talk about traveling light. Something that we need to do in our life, in our walk with God, to travel light. You know, I've been, we've traveled to a number of places and, and haven't really, we haven't flown internationally with our children at this point, but I've seen other families go through the airport. And I always look at the, the poor travel attendant who's pushing the, the cart with all the shopping, or the, not the shopping, all the travel luggage and the suitcases on it. I always feel kind of bad for the attendant who has something like in the next picture, which is not traveling light. Huge. Sometimes you see these carts with humongous stacks of luggage on them, or you see vehicles loaded. You know, we went on a, a road trip three years ago, and our van was packed. Packed. I couldn't see out the back window in the van. It was so full of stuff. Sometimes in the natural, we can't travel light, even as much as we may like to just throw on a backpack and go. <laughs> but what does the Bible say to our life in the Spirit? And we're going to look in Hebrews chapter 12, and verse 1, as our theme verse for this morning, Hebrews 12, 1, says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, to lay aside every weight weight and run. And, run. and I'd never paid attention to this verse before. I'd always thought that the weight that it spoke of was the sin in our lives. But when I was pondering it this last week, I realized that it says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin. So there are sometimes there are weights in our life that we wouldn't put into the sin category necessarily, but they're things that would hold us back, that would weigh us down, that would keep us from being able to run at full speed. Imagine running a marathon in your favorite dress or your favorite suit while pulling a couple of suitcases carrying that hiking pack all full of your most precious things that you didn't want to leave behind and all because you love those things so much would that make sense no see there's appropriate things for appropriate times and running a marathon is not the time to bring your suitcases or to wear your favorite clothing outfits it is not appropriate. And that's what the Apostle Paul saying in this verse, lay aside the weight because you're running. Bring along what is appropriate. And so just as it doesn't make sense to run with all that extra weight, it does not make sense to run the marathon of the Christian life tied to so many weights that we cannot or refuse to leave behind if the Lord asks them of us. Hebrews 11 the chapter before this verse, is all about the heroes of faith. You read through that chapter and it goes through some amazing people who lived for the Lord. Imperfect, yes, but they were willing to, to, to live their life for God. And so the therefore in verse 1 of Hebrews 12 starts right with that word, therefore, we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, is showing us how these people are the examples to us of one's who left their weight behind, who were willing to do whatever God wanted them to do, even at what would seem like great cost to them. They didn't let things weigh them down in their pursuit of God. Again, they were not perfect, <clears throat> but they are great examples to us. And I was thinking of some of these examples. Noah. Noah gave up everything in his life to go build an ark. Everything. And to become the laughingstock of the world at that time, to go build an ark. Why? Because God told him to. He was willing to pursue God to leave everything else behind to pursue what God told him to. Abraham, many different times in his life, gave up things to pursue what God told him to. Moses left the pleasures and the riches of Egypt to go and lead a rebellious, complaining people through a desert. I don't know he knew entirely what he was getting himself into, but he gave up a lot to lead God's people. Why? 
because God told him to. And he was willing to pursue God and didn't let all the things that he had, all the pleasures that he had, all the riches that he had, the power that he had, was a tremendous man in the natural. And he was willing to let that all go, to not be a weight to him, to hold him back. So we're going to look at three specific areas in our own life will make this applicable to us. Three specific things that can be weights that can hold us back if we put them above God. And we're going to go to Mark chapter 4, verse 19 for these. Mark 4, 19. This is part of the parable of the sower. Or let's start in verse 18. And others are the ones sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word and it proves unfruitful in their life. So the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things. In another account of the parable of the sower, we find in Luke chapter 8, verse 14, Jesus says at that last part of the verse, where in, in Mark's account it says it proves unfruitful, in Luke's account it says brings no fruit to perfection. It's somebody who lives their life, their Christian life for the Lord, but because they're so distracted by these other things, these weights that hold them back, they've got some fruit, but it's not brought to perfection. It is imperfect fruit that never matures. And I was thinking about fruit. In one sense, fruit is what is inside of us, right? Fruit is our character. The Bible talks about the fruits of the Spirit. And when it talks about the fruits of the Spirit that are to be worked in our life, it says love and joy, and peace, and patience. These are all character qualities that are built into us. Fruit that is worked out into our life. And so I, I believe the parable of the sower, when it says they don't have fruit that comes to maturity, means they may have some areas that show some fruit, but it lacks maturity. So they, this person may show some love for Christ, the love of God to others. And then at other times, there's obviously a lack of love. They may show some peace, but at other times, they're like a walking storm. They may have some joy, but other times, they're down. Now, that could be because the fruit is being brought to maturity, because they're learning and walking with God. But it could be because there are things in their life that are choking the fruit out, that are keeping it from maturing in their life. And it's weighting them down. It's holding them back. So that is one area of fruit in somebody's life that may not, may not come to maturity because of these three things. And in another sense, fruit is also what we accomplish in our life when the Bible talks about fruit. It is the works that we do. It is how we have lived for Christ, what we have done for the Lord. And it can also speak of those things, that somebody may have some fruit to show in their walk with the Lord, and yet they're so distracted by these weights, by these cares of the world and a pursuit of worldly things that they don't have near as much fruit as they should because they're held back by weights. They're running, but they can't run as fast because they have some things that are distracting them. So it is immature fruit. Mature in the verse here in, in, in this passage talks about, or it means to be a bearer to completion. A bearer, so the tree is bearing the fruit to completion. It's brought all the way to perfection or to what it, the way that it should be. So let's look at these three areas. The cares of this world. What is a care? It's a concern. It's a worry about things that are going on in the world. If you look it up in Strong's, it also is described or defined as a distraction a distraction from the world. But a care is really a distraction. It's something that you're thinking about. And we heard in Sunday school this morning about how Angeline got taken up with politics at a point and then had to give that up. Why? Because it was such a care. It was such, and that became a burden, right? Something that held her back because she was just thinking about it and worried about it and meditating about it. And, but though, any of those things, I said politics, it can be so many things that people have cares about in this world, concerns about how things are happening in this world. But 
if we meditate on them and we spend our time focusing on them, they will be a weight that actually holds us back from being fruitful for the Lord. I was thinking some of us are more laid back by personality. I am one of the ones that is laid back. I don't know if that's because of how my family was raised or that's just how I am by nature. Some of you would be less laid back. Some may be more laid back. So we all have this natural position that we approach this in. Some, you know, may get a lot more worked up, may have stronger opinions about things. But regardless, anything that becomes a care can weigh us down. So what are some of these cares of the world? And it really depends on you and me for what the specific one or ones are. But we all are pretty much guaranteed to have some of them if we let ourselves focus on those things. We can all let ourselves have a care or a concern. Um, let's read what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6. We're going to read a passage here, Matthew 6, 24 through 34. We'll read this out of the ESV. Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. And then look where it goes to from here. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about the body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food? and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to the span of his life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil, nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. You have enough going on today. Don't be anxious about tomorrow. But it's the whole passage starts out, you cannot serve God and money. And I never made this connection before, but you, what you, who you serve, really, if you think of a servant, somebody who takes care of their master, they're concerned about what their master thinks, about how to do what pleases their master. And what it's saying in this verse is, when it talks about serving money, means to have such a drive for it that you, because you're anxious about having enough provision for yourself. And so you're serving it. You're thinking, how am I going to get it? How am I going to get more of it? Where is it going to come from? And at the root of that is a worry, a care, a concern about provision. And Jesus says, don't worry about that stuff. Your heavenly father will take care of you just as he does these different animals or different plants that Jesus talked about. He said, but you seek first my kingdom. Live for me. There's the focus. Pursue me, and I'll take care of these things. Don't let them be your master. I think even some of the great issues that we can get worked up about can come down to an issue of trust at a very basic level. We can get ourselves all concerned, all worried about some sort of issue, and and it comes right down to this very basic level of provision or protection or something like that. And then I was thinking of some different areas and looking at it from both sides of the aisle, you could say. But God can provide for you and God can provide for me no matter what political party is in power. Who's the provider? God. 
and he can still take care of us no matter who is in power. God can protect you with or without a gun. Both sides of the aisle. Who is the protector? It's not the gun. It is God. The Bible says some trust in chariots and some in horses. We will remember God, the name of our God, because he is the protector. God can keep you alive with or without a pandemic and with or without a vaccine. Both sides of the aisle. These are areas where people today have great concern and great care. But at the end of the day, it is God that we have to look to. And we have to trust him. So at the end of the day, a lot of these concerns and cares issue are a trust issue. And we want to, to take things and to, to figure them out ourselves, but we have to trust our God. One of the heroes of faith that it talks about in Hebrews 11 is David. And I'm reading through accounts of King David in my devotions right now. And he went through a lot. He really did. Um, a lot of difficulty in his life. A lot of turmoil. But this is what he had to say. I looked up three different psalms that he wrote. And I'm going to read three verses. The first is Psalm 16, verse 8. I know the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. Psalm 27, 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation, so why should I be afraid? The Lord is my fortress, protecting me from danger, so why should I tremble? Psalm 62, verse 6. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress, where I will not be shaken. God is where King David went, despite all that he went through. God was his fortress. God was the one he took those cares and concerns to. He had a lot of difficulty. He fought a lot of battles. He had a lot of family issues. And yet, he took them to the Lord and said, you are my rock. You are my fortress. There's a very familiar scripture in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7 that says, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. That's where we're supposed to put our care, is to the Lord. If you or I get worked up or worried about things, you have one place to go with it, and that is to God. That's the one place, casting all your care on him because he cares about you. He does. God cares for you and for me, and he loves us. And he says, like a good dad would with a, little, with a child who is going through a hard time, come here. You know, let me give you a hug. Let me give you some advice. Let me comfort you and give you peace. Let me walk with you through this. That's our Heavenly Father when we get concerned and cared about, or cared, when we care and are concerned about things. He says, come to me. Come to me. That's all you have to do. Come to me. Don't let this be stuff that weighs you down. Travel light. Let those cares go and don't keep carrying them. Let the Lord carry them for you. So the cares of this world. The next thing that Jesus talked about in the parable of the sower, the next thing that is a, a, a weight or something that chokes out the, the, the fruit, the life out of a Christian, it says the deceitfulness of riches. The deceitfulness of riches. I looked up that word and it comes from the word that means delusion. The delusion of riches, or something that's not really there. It's, it's, it's not real. It seems like something, but it's really not. This is what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, verses 19 through 20. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. See, the riches of this life, they're not what matters. They're not what is important. What is important? Living for God and living for eternity. That is important because one day you will be gone. One day I will be gone. You know what? I guarantee it. 
based on fact <laughs> and what has happened throughout history. We will all be gone. And guess what happens with our stuff and our money? It's left behind. We don't take it with us. It's just here. And my kids and your kids will be working hard to sort through some of the stuff to get rid of some of the stuff that we work so hard to get. It's life. It happens. So riches are a bit of a delusion, aren't they? They're only for the here and now. They also don't last. Proverbs chapter 23, verses 4 and 5 says, Don't wear yourself out trying to get rich. Be wise enough to know when to quit. In the blink of an eye, wealth disappears, for it will sprout wings and fly away like an eagle. And this is what Jesus also referenced when, when he said, don't lay up treasure where thieves can take it away or moths can come in and eat it and destroy the value of what you have. Sometimes riches are completely gone in a day, just like that. So they can be stolen. The economy can completely crash and be nothing. We've never seen it in our lifetime, but other places, other countries certainly have, where everything they have is all of a sudden nothing. Riches can be burned in a fire, washed in a flood, lost in a war. Everything we have can be gone, just like this. Some of the wealthiest people that we know in the world can become some of the poorest, just like this, depending on what happens in the world. They're a, an illusion or a delusion. They're not something that we should depend on. Sometimes riches disappear slowly. Most of the stuff you look outside and see hasn't been around for more than 100 years. Some stuff a little longer, if it's made of rock or certain kinds of metal, but most things don't last. Most things are gone. And then even the money that we have, inflation will take it away. It has. That's one of the slow things that makes what we have worth less than it used to be. And I was looking up some examples of this. In 1932, so 90 years ago or so, there were special railroad fares in at least one part of the country where they were charging one cent per mile to travel on the railroad. And I looked that up, and if you were to take, if the railroad followed the highway, you could get to New York City for just over $2 on a railroad about 90 years ago. So what happened to the person 90 years ago that had $2 and kept it and hid it under their pillow? How much do they have now? $2. How much will it buy now? Well, the saying when I was younger was a loaf of bread. You can't even really buy a loaf of bread for $2 unless you get the cheapest of the cheap. Then maybe you can. But from a railroad fare to New York City down to a cheap loaf of bread in 90 years, that's inflation. In 1946, there were 170,000 GM employees that were on strike. They were on strike because they were offered 18 and a half cents an hour and they wanted 19 and a half cents an hour for a wage. And we laugh at that because right now, those in New York, our minimum wage is 12.50 an hour, $12.50. In 1946, it was, they were looking at 18 and a half to less than 20 cents an hour. But it had the same buying power basically as now, you know, closely anyways but the money lost value. See, it's a delusion. It's not something we should depend on and look towards and put our trust in. And that's why Jesus said one of those three areas that can be a weight, that can choke out the life, the, the way that a Christian should live is this pursuit of riches, the deceitfulness that is in them. They're just a thing. For many of us, they're just a piece of paper or now a piece of plastic or numbers on a screen. And we don't trust those things. We trust in God. Amen? In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 10, the Apostle Paul says, Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing... With these, we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, 
into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many things. So what is the issue that is said in this verse? In verse 8 or verse 9, those who desire to be rich, those who have made it their pursuit. Does this mean you cannot have natural wealth and be a Christian and follow Christ? It's not what it's saying. It's saying if it is your desire to pursue after these things, if you love money, it will pull your heart away. It will turn you and be a weight that holds you back, that chokes out the fruit of your life. So the problem is with the desire to be rich. Pursuing riches rather than pursuing God is a delusion that will weigh us down. And it is a very temporary perspective versus the eternal perspective. Who is the source of everything that you have? God. It's not money. God doesn't even need money to provide for us. He often uses it. He tells us to go to work. To, to make a living for our family. That is in the Bible. We are supposed to work. But we have to, even in the midst of that, not view it as the source of our provision. God is the source. And we go to him in times of difficulty. We pursue what is eternal. As we said of Moses, he left all the riches behind. He left his great earning income behind in Egypt. And he went into the wilderness to lead a difficult people and become basically a wandering nomad because God told him to, and he wanted to do what God said. He didn't say, I want to stay in Egypt because I have such a good life. So travel light in this area too. Let go of a pursuit of riches or of natural wealth. It's not going to last. It's a distraction, and it will weigh us down if that is our pursuit. Number three, the third thing Jesus said is the desire for other things. The desire for other things. And in the alternate account, the, the parallel account in Luke 8, 14, it says it's written as the pleasures of life. So the desire for other things, the pleasures of life. I would call this the desire for stuff to have or stuff to do. This is the stuff part of our life where the last one was the riches or the money part. I was thinking of Abraham, one of the great examples of faith in Hebrews 11. He gave up the best land to his nephew. He wasn't so stuck on having the best stuff, having the best place. It didn't weigh him down. He said, okay, you know what? You pick. I don't care. You know, there's that laid back attitude. You go right ahead. I'll take whatever there is because his eyes were on the Lord, and he knew that God would take care of him. He had a lot of stuff. Abraham did, but his stuff was not his idol. It was not something that took the place of God in his life, not a strong desire. Somebody famous once said, it's not how much stuff you have, it's how much your stuff has you. Sarah Brogan. That's a quote from her. If you can't live without your stuff, if you spend the majority of your time thinking about your stuff, maintaining your stuff, using your stuff, and working for money to pay for your stuff, then your stuff probably has you. Life is not about our stuff, but it can very much and I'm preaching to myself too, we are blessed with a lot of stuff in this society. Those of us who are parents look at our kids and go, they have too much stuff. Sometimes we should look at our own life as well. But this stuff can take our life. And that's one of the things Jesus said will choke out the mature fruit of a Christian. It will weigh them back so they cannot run the race as fully as they should be able to. Now, you can hear a sermon like this, and it could make you want to go and get rid of all your stuff. Sarah has read books before by a certain author that when she finishes the book, she comes to me and says, I think we need to sell everything. <laughs> <laughs> it 
And I say we need to get rid of that book. But no, they're a very good author and very, very, say very well what they say. But the point of this message is not to go and get rid of your stuff, but to make sure it does not have you. It should not own you. It should not be the focus of my life or of your life. In the parable of the rich young ruler, remember the story, this rich young ruler came to Jesus and we have no indication really that his riches and his possessions were a problem until Jesus said, give them up and follow me. It was at that point we are made aware that they were an issue for him. He was blessed with lots of stuff. I'm sure we could find biblical support for him. Oh, he was a good steward of what God had given to him. He was wise. He took care of his stuff. All of this is good. All of this is good. This is stuff we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be good stewards of what God gives us. But at the point that God says, give it up, if we are not willing to, that is the problem. It all comes back to God. It all comes back to living for God. And if God says, I don't want you to have this, I want you to do away with this, I want you to get rid of this, and we say, no, now we're weighted down. Now our life is being choked out because we are not willing to obey, just like the rich young ruler, not willing to follow what God is telling us to do. So the whole point of this sermon is not that you would go out and get rid of all your money and get rid of all your stuff and get rid of anything that you find pleasurable in life and go live in a tent and eat rice and beans. That is not the point. The point is God should rule in our life. And these things should not weigh us back. So if he brings these things into your life, fine. Ask him what he wants you to do with your stuff. Ask him what he wants you to do with your money. Take your cares to him. If he requires you to give them up, give them up. Be willing to. We were talking to somebody recently that was considering a, a, a purchase in their life, and we were just talking through it, and they said one thing that, that stood out to me in a great way. They said, I have a call on my life. If God tells me to go to the mission field and get rid of all of this that I have and what I'm considering, I will in an instant go. What an amazing perspective, because that is what we are, how we are supposed to be. That's how we're supposed to live. You know, this is just stuff. If God calls me to go and get stuff to use for his kingdom, I'll do it. If God wants to bless me with riches for his kingdom, so be it. But if God tells me to give it up, I will. That is the right perspective in traveling right. It makes me think of the man with the story, the story of the man with the pearl of great price. He heard of that pearl and he said, you know, I, I, God wants me to go do that. I'm getting rid of all this. I will not let it hold me back from pursuing what God has told me to do. We were recently at somebody else's house and they have this sign on their wall that says, live simply. Live simply. I think that's the right attitude for us to keep. Live simply. If God blesses us with stuff, fine. But we want to be, not let those things hold us back. I know somebody else years ago that were supposed to go to serve the Lord on the mission field. God had called them to do that. And they were in the process of getting ready to go. And then they got themselves a nice truck. They went on payments for it and they could no longer afford to go to the mission field. Their stuff had them. And there they were, not able to go because the stuff became the priority over what God had called them to do. So travel light. Let go of a desire to pursue stuff and to pursue pleasure, stuff to do. It will only distract us and weigh us down. We live for God. I begin the conclusion with a quote from Matthew Henry. He said, Inordinate care for the present life or fondness for it is a dead weight upon the soul that pulls it down when it should ascend upwards and pulls it back when it should press forward. It makes duty and difficulties harder and heavier than they should be. If we have any of these three areas that we struggle with, they will make duty, so the things we're supposed to do, difficulties, the things we're going through in life, 
It will make them harder and heavier than they should be. What's that saying? It will weigh you down. It will weigh you down. And it will choke out your life so that you never have mature fruit. This is not the time to be weighted down. It is not the time to be held back. This is the time to travel light in our walk with the Lord. This is also not the time to be sitting here thinking of other people that you know who have too much stuff or too many cares and concerns or too much money. This is not the time, and really there is not usually the time for you to do that. The Bible tells us to take it ourselves, to judge ourselves, to look at our own life and say, is this my issue? So as we close this morning, we're going to take a minute and we're each going to go to God ourselves and say, God, is this my issue? And confess to him, if you're overly concerned with things in the world, if you're pursuing riches or you're pursuing stuff and pleasure and not able to, to give those up if God would ask, confess that to him and ask him to help you pursue him and live for eternity. So take a minute, take that to the Lord. Lord, help us to travel light in our journey here on earth. Help us not to be weighted down, held back, or have our, our life choked out that we can't bring fruit to maturity in our walk with you. Lord, help us to look to you as our source, as the one that we pursue, the one that we live for, and help us to live for eternity, not to live for the temporary. Help us to have the right importance, to place the right importance on our life. You are such a good God. You are such a good Father. You are so patient with us. But Lord, we recognize that you call us to live this way, to live for you and not live for these other things. Help us to do so. In your name, amen. Amen.